Okay, I think I'm connected. Okay, thank you, Eastman, for your kind uh, introduction. And also, uh, dear colleagues, friends, and ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome uh, you to my session of the Geislick and You Second Online Congress. Uh, I hope everyone is safe and well in these difficult times, and I will proceed with my uh, presentation. Okay, so the title of my presentation is Rich Preservation Using the Open Healing Approach. Is there a limit? And I will be talking about open healing, uh, the history of open healing, how it started, uh, and root, uh, rich preservation with collagen membrane. And I like to also talk about some limits in open healing approach and uh, rich preservation in compromised sockets, whether it's single or multiple. And then I'll finish off with uh, gross fact, some gross factors uh, that accelerate open healing. Okay, so we first start with the history of open healing technique. Uh, the history of open healing technique, I think uh, dates back to the late 1990s when uh, Dr. Bharti et al uh, published these two papers, I think which were uh, used, they used highly dense microporous PTFE membrane instead of uh, EPTFE membranes in so socket preservation procedures, uh, leaving them open, I guess, for uh, open healing and uh, to heal with uh, secondary intentional healing. Then we come to the first, uh, one of the first reports for the use of a resorbable collagen membrane. And I think it was uh, introduced by Lekovit et al, but the surgeries uh, were performed with a primary wound closure. And I guess this was the accepted method of wound healing for quite some time. And when we look at this consensus, uh, the osteology uh, consensus report from 2012, uh, raising a flap and closing with a primary wound closure were, was still recommended, I think, at this time, until this classic study uh, from Daniel Kadaropoli came along where socket preservation was compared to extraction alone in 41 patients, the ex experimental group receiving a bovine bone mineral plus collagen membrane and leaving it open showed better resistance to uh, horizontal and vertical resorption uh, compared to unassisted sockets. Then comes this uh, sy systematic review by Orgues et al uh, in 2013 and I think it suggests that primary closure may not be as critical in the success of rich preservation procedures, uh, leading to the RCT by uh, Dr. Barone et al. in 2014. And this was a very, very classic paper, I think, where the uh, flapless open healing group was compared to the flapped uh, wound closure group. And when we look at the results from this study, uh, the flapless rich preservation group showed less horizontal resorption and more keratinization in the socket entrance where it was uh, left, left open for healing. And then when you look at the table here, when you look at the width of keratinized gingiva and also the bone width, I think the flapless procedures are showing much better results compared to the uh, flapped procedure. So this was the beginning, I think, and uh, following this period, Numerous preclinical and clinical studies have been published uh, to support the efficacy of rich preservation procedure, uh, procedures to resist uh, dimensional changes uh, that follow tooth extraction. And I was always uh, curious how much soft tissue thickness we would gain from open healing. And we finally have an answer as we have this beautiful study, uh, a very important, beautiful study by the Zurich group, uh, Dr. Thomas et al, and of course, Dr. Jung, of course. And the results show that in the area where open healing was attempted, uh, three millimeter thickness of soft tissue was formed at the ridge crest after two months. I think this is very, very important. And I guess this gives you some confidence in open healing uh, using a collagen membrane. Uh, my personal preference is to use the collagen membrane of porcine origin uh, by Geislick, uh, called BioGuide. I'm sure everybody knows this, uh, and a lot of you use, use uh, BioGuide. And uh, when you look at this, uh, because of its non-cross-link properties uh, that enable the membrane to stretch, I think this would serve as the uh, optimal wound stabilizing uh, 
agent also. And also its bioactive role in attracting important cells for regeneration. And here are some uh, critical studies from Dr. Thompson's group, uh, the Gothenburg uh, Biomaterials Group. And this paper by Dr. Turi and Dr. El Ghali and Omar Omar proving uh, that collagen membrane is not just a passive barrier, uh, it's actually embedding growth factors from surrounding tissue and secreting factors uh, for faster bone formation and remodeling. So here are some of the cases I'd like to share with you of uh, rich preservation with open healing. Uh, we can see that the socket entrance in the three cases here are quite large. Also, uh, I would like to I'd like you to note that a quick epithelialization is achieved at one week when you look at seven days, 11 and, and four days and complete closure of the socket is achieved at uh, 30 to 60 days. I think this is quite elegant, really, really elegant. Okay, uh, so far so good. Uh, now I would like to spend a little more time on the limits of rich preservation with open healing. As you can see in the slides, not all sockets are the same. Uh, some may have more destruction than the others. Uh, some may even have no walls remaining, I think. You, you could see the cases here without the walls. So we decided to call these type of sockets uh, compromise extraction sockets. And I would like to spend some time to share some of our experiences with the uh, compromised sockets where our group has been doing extensive research for some time. So this is a study that has just been accepted and we try to propose a classification system about compromised extraction sockets that include all possibilities of hard and soft tissue loss. So here from type one to type five, we try to include all the possibilities of soft tissue and hard tissue loss. And uh, just to briefly uh, summarize this, looking at the prevalence, we found that in type four sockets here, uh, the, the simultaneous uh, buccal and lingual wall loss, uh, whether greater, of, uh, less, well, greater or less than 50%, really constituted 87% of all sockets. And then another pa paper talking about uh, erratically healed sockets. Uh, erratically healed sockets are sockets that do not heal by itself. Whatever you do, it does not heal by itself. And this is a CBCT of a patient returning after 12 months uh, that received a, a, traumatic, a, a traumatic extraction and a thorough debridement. I always thoroughly uh, try to thoroughly debride the area. And uh, 12 months, I think it's enough time for healing. As, and as you can see, after 12, 12 months, there is absolutely no bone inside the socket, just infiltrated connective tissue. So from this study, uh, we were able to conclude that uh, some extraction sockets failed to heal properly, even after thorough debridement and long period of healing. And also sufficient healing time may not always support proper healing of the extraction sockets. So we decided to call these sockets erratically healed sockets. And I think this is a very, very good indication for rich preservation procedures. If we are able to confront our patients from the beginning that these type of sockets won't heal, heal by itself. And if we perform uh, rich preservation procedures, I think this will, this will serve as a very, very good indication for rich preservation. Now we come to another study. Uh, this study was done in dogs that actually showed delayed healing in areas with chronic inflammation. So you can see uh, the sclerotic changes around the roots where a chronic infection uh, was inflicted. And now when we zoom in to the site of interest, I think we can see that in the compromised sockets, the Volkmann's canals are closed and collapsed, affecting the blood supply to the, to the area. And uh, Volkmann's channel are small channels in the bone that transmit blood vessels from the periosteum into the bone. So I guess if this area is, is compromised, then you have a short shortness in blood, blood supply. So I guess that affects the, the whole, the whole me mechanism of healing. And that's why you're seeing some delays 
in these type of uh, chronic in inflammatory uh, sockets. Uh, then we come to our randomized uh, control, uh, randomized clinical trial. Okay, I'm very proud to say that this RCT was the winner of the, uh, the first prize uh, clinical research at the uh, Osteology International Symposium in 2019. And the title of this, uh, it's, it's, it's just been uh, published in, in JCP, and the title was, Is Rich Preservation Effective in Periodontally Com Compromised Extraction Sockets, ARCT? And uh, we included compromised sockets only, and the sockets had to have a decent of greater than 50% of socket heights. The test group received uh, extraction plus a rich preservation with uh, DBBMC and collagen membrane for open healing. The control group received extraction plus spontaneous healing. And then we did analysis, uh, CBCT analysis for bone uh, dimensional changes. And also uh, we took impressions and scans for soft tissue uh, dimensional changes. And then histomorphometry for, uh, with uh, bone, bio, bi uh, bone core biopsies to see how much new bone formation we were getting uh, from the, uh, from the, uh, be prior to the surgeries. Uh, in this study, uh, since these were compromised extraction sockets, we used a collagen matrix called DBBNC for volume stability and also structural integrity and uh, space maintenance in areas where bony walls were, uh, are resorbed and only the flaps remain. So we tried to compensate for that with uh, DBBMC. And uh, when we, when iPhone for first came out, I think it revolutionized and changed our lives. And I think for these type of compromised extraction sockets, this type of uh, matrix type bone graft is the same. I love it, DBBMC. And it's very useful uh, for these type of uh, compromised sockets where there is a lot of destruction. And uh, I'd like to show you the video. Uh, this is a model we use uh, for our uh, hands-on courses. And just to show how the surgeries were done, okay, we first did the atraumatic extraction, and then you either use a blade or a surgical curette to remove the granulation tissue and also the all the inflammatory tissues. We could see the bulging of the buccal flap, uh, that's because there's no bone. So this is a type four, according to our cl classification. And then we remove uh, the inflammatory tissues. Okay, and try to thoroughly uh, curette this area for a very thorough debridement. And then we are using DBBMC to graft this area. Note that there is no uh, bony buccal wall here on the buccal side, also on the lingual side. And then we try to uh, slip in the collagen membrane. Okay, this is BioGuide, of course. I usually have music for this, but uh, I thought it would interrupt. So, uh, but actually, yeah, it seemed a little long without the music. Anyway, you, we're using the crisscross suture here to finish off uh, the rich preservation procedure. Okay, so yes, and then we'll cut off the sutures. So to save a little bit of time, I would like to move on. Okay, uh, so just briefly summarizing the results uh, in the spontaneous uh, healing group. Okay, uh, the, the yellow line outlines the socket uh, before extraction, the blue line 
uh, four months later. And when you over overlap them and when you uh, overlap, you can see that there is a huge resorption, especially on the buccal side. So this is this was the results for the spontaneous healing group. And then when we look at the rich preservation group, actually, uh, we are seeing some gain in this area, uh, a little bit of vertical gain for horizontal dimension is a little bit of uh, resorption, especially in the uh, one millimeter zone uh, under CEJ, but it, it did much better than the uh, spontaneous healing group. And then when we look at the soft tissues, we were able to see that the rich preservation group did a little better than the spontaneous healing group, corresponding to the color here, the rich preservation group lost a, uh, one to two millimeters uh, compared to three, four millimeters in the sp spontaneous healing group. So, and also it was really exciting to see that even in these compromised situation and even after stuffing in all these bone biomaterial material into the socket, we are able to get 31% of new bone formation in the test group. And this is really amazing, it's exciting. And uh, now we come to the biggest challenge ever. I think it was a very uh, challenging situation for rich preservation. After the RCT, our group has decided to write up a case report with the most severe destruction in single sockets and try to show the histology as well. So here are, here are some of the cases at baseline and four months. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, the case you see in blue are the cases before extraction, and in brown uh, are the ridges four months following uh, extraction and immediate preservation. And I'd like you to see the beautiful histology obtained with the biopsy cores here after uh, four months. Also, this is the second case. Um, notice the ar architecture and the walls uh, that have been re-sculptured, re uh, the flaps, probably served as the barrier here, I think. Uh, the original shape and contour uh, of the socket has been restored. And this has been done with the use of DBBMC and a collagen membrane. Okay, another case of architectural uh, rebuilding and nice histology. Uh, you can see the dots that border uh, the pristine bone and newly augmented area and uh, nice histology, of course. So you could see the re-sculpturing again. Uh, and in case some of you may ask if it's safe to do these type of ridge preservation procedures, especially immediate, immediately after uh, extraction, uh, our answer is yes. Uh, and we, we would like to use our study as a reference that was published in 2000, 2017 in JCP and out of 307 patients who received immediate rich preservation after tooth extraction, only two have failed, uh, giving a success rate of 99%. And this is quite remarkable when we take into account that compromised sockets were included in the data set. And now coming to the final part of the, my presentation, we now know rich preservation may be, may be highly predictable in single sockets, uh, regardless of the severity of destruction, okay? But, but can this principle be applied to multiple extraction sockets? And my answer is, I, I don't know, I don't know. I still don't know, but maybe why not try? Uh, so someone has to do it. And uh, I, I think this was actually the first attempt for me in my case. Uh, I, I am still very cautious about this, and we are not talking about healed sites, by the way. Uh, I, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. However, when you look at this case, uh, extraction sockets, and see that in a week, uh, we are getting nice coverage and uh, epithelialization, maybe, maybe we could apply this to multiple extraction sockets. Some of you might not agree with me, but we are in the very primitive stages. Uh, and uh, we are working on this project as well. And of course, uh, we are in the very early stages and we are trying to expand the principles and concepts of rich preservation augmentation procedures into multiple extraction sites. 
And just to share with you some of the cases, uh, this is a case of preservation augmentation performed with DBBMC and uh, collagen matrix, was left to open heal for open healing. And the healing is not quite nice as the ones I'm used to when I use a uh, bioguide, but we, we do get a thick rich after four weeks and a uh, nice horizontal width that, that was anticipated when we did the surgery. Uh, you can see that the horizontal width was preserved and uh, two implants, uh, eight millimeter long, were placed uh, into the sites. Okay, now we move on to the second case. We have uh, two implants uh, that were uh, broken. Uh, and we had to remove three implants. And after removing the implant, the first implant was really uh, very close to the nerve. So we decided to build up like vertical augmentation, try to make a hump. And then what we did was we used uh, the collagen membrane, tried to expand it and then pull it to the other side and tied it uh, so that we could have that stretching ability. We could utilize that stretching ability of, of a bioguide and just uh, three simple interruptive sutures here. We left it for open healing. Okay, excuse me. Okay, and then this is the healing after uh, I think it was seven days to 10 days. I think we are seeing beautiful open healing even in this uh, multiple sites. And then this is healing at one month, four months, and a little bit of hump, of hump like a camel get back that was uh, made here. And then these are the results. After four months, uh, we see a hump here like a camel back. And then we were able to place uh, two implants for a bridge. So this case, I think, uh, was done for multiple extraction sockets. Uh, and then I would like to move on to the third case. Okay, uh, these are extraction sockets plus uh, so healed sites. Maybe I'm pushing a little bit, a little bit, but what we, we decided to use DBBMC in this case, and we grafted the area, we grafted to the these healed sites also to just to see as a maybe an ex experiment experiment maybe, and then uh, we use BioGuide, uh, and I know we're, we're pushing a little bit, uh, but we tried open healing in this case. And just to show you the healing, uh, this is healing at seven days. And we were able to uh, achieve uh, epithelialization, almost complete uh, epithelialization at 30 days. And then this is a slide at four months. We have a nice thick ridge. And then we did guided surgery uh, to place three implants. I think for economic purposes, the patient only was able to receive uh, three implants in this case. And then this is after the healing of, of the implants. And then we have the three implants. And just, I know it's still experimental, but we have been uh, working on some type of uh, gross factors and hyaluronic acid, in my case, we're showing very positive results in preclinical studies. I know uh, Dr. Tony Skullian is also uh, doing research with uh, hyaluronic acid. I think the, the, the latest paper that was uh, just accepted in, in Journal of Periodontology uh, combined the use of DBBMC with uh, hyaluronic acid, and we, sh we saw very positive res results in compromised extraction in, in dogs. So maybe if we use this, utilize this type of uh, gross factors, I think it could help on the long in the long run. Also, uh, we're looking at uh, gross factors for soft tissues also. Uh, we have worked with EGF and now we're looking into uh, many different type of gross factors to help uh, promote healing in for open healing in this type of uh, compromised extraction sockets. So to summarize uh, my presentation today, uh, rich preservation augmentation with open healing can be quite promising and predictable, even in the most uh, challenging single extraction sockets. Uh, the use of DBBMC with collagen membrane may be a good approach in treating compromised extraction sockets. Uh, rich preservation augmentation using the open healing approach remains a challenge in multiple extraction sockets. And I'm not talking about heal sites. 
However, if advances can be made to make this indication more predictable, I think this can be a tremendous benefit for the clinician and the patient as the procedure is simple and easier than the conventional augmentation procedures. So more data and research is needed in this area. And I think I'm at the end of my pres presentation and I'd like to thank you uh, for listening. Uh, thank you for your kind at attention. And Kamsamida, thank you very much. Thank you so much for this very uh, good and very interesting presentation. We just have a little bit of time to uh, maybe for one question, and that would be: um, What kind of complications do you do you get? You know, when you do these very advanced, no buckle, no lingual um, socket grafting, if ever you ever see any infection or a continuous lack of. Uh, of loosening some graft particles like the popcorn effect or anything. Okay, I think in, in single sockets, uh, we are seeing less uh, complications. Uh, however, if we expand this concept to two sockets, maybe we lose some bone up at the top. So yeah, yeah that is part of the complication. But as far as uh, the debridement is concerned, if you are able to get rid of the infection uh, completely, and also if you prescribe uh, system systemic antibiotics for at least a week or so, I think you're okay. So we have a publication from uh, JCP in 2017. Uh, the safety was quite high with the right biomaterial and the complete thorough debridement I think you will be okay in, in single sockets. However, if we expand a little careful, I think it, it's a little primitive, but we need to move on. And uh, maybe, maybe we might have an answer in the near future. And we, if we utilize some of the gross factors, I, I think that would be a great help uh, down the line. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isman. Yeah. Very nice presentation.